Hi, I'm Chris Richardson, and welcome to season two of This Is Not A Pipe podcast. I've been really overwhelmed by the amount of great feedback I've received about the interviews, the books we're talking about, and the overall project of This Is Not A Pipe podcast. And I just want to say thank you to all the listeners and people who have given their support. I have had the privilege of speaking with brilliant people last season, and this season is going to be phenomenal. I first want to say, if you haven't yet had a chance to check out our website at tinapp.org or any of the social media on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, please feel free to check those out. And if you can, please leave a review. Today, I'm honored to have Meredith Grossard talking about her book, Artificial Unintelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Thank you so much for being on. And Meredith, maybe we can just start with uh, what it is that you've been doing. So I'm a computer scientist and a journalist. Uh, I do data journalism, which is the practice of finding stories in numbers and using numbers to tell stories. And I got the idea for this book when I started looking back on my career And I realized that I had been hearing the same promises about the bright technological future for decades. Mm -hmm. And none of these promises had come true. And so I started wondering, why is that? Why do people keep believing these empty promises about technology uh, in the face of really substantial evidence to the contrary? And this book was born. So I explain some technological terms, uh, and then I take readers on a number of uh, adventures in computer programming. Yeah, and I thought one of the interesting things about this book is that it's accessible for people who don't know anything almost about computers, but it's also interesting for people who do. How do you decide what to include and what to not include so that you don't sort of alienate people on either side of that knowledge spectrum? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because that was the hardest thing about Mm. writing this book. So there are many, many computational concepts that are very easy to understand. And there are many that are really hard to understand. So everything that a computer does ultimately comes down to math. And you can be a perfectly competent computer programmer with only the math you learned up until like sixth eighth grade, right? So often people are very intimidated by uh, the higher level math that you need to do advanced computing, but you can actually do a lot of computing without, uh, without doing really intensive math. But it's very difficult to gauge how much your reader already knows about math Mm -hmm. or how much your reader already knows about computing. So one of the things that I tried to do in the book is I tried to balance that. Um, I tried to write kind of at the level of my undergraduates, because those are the uh, those are the folks who I talk to the most about computing, and they're really wonderful. Um, when you're talking about artificial intelligence, it's really important to start with some definitions. There are generally uh, two kinds of artificial intelligence. There's general AI and narrow AI. So general AI is the Hollywood stuff, that's the uh, the idea that there's you know that someday somebody is going to create a computer that's going to be smarter than a human and the computer is going to take over the world and we're going to all be you know killed by the you know autonomous intelligence blah 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 mm-hmm. like that's the imaginary stuff and then narrow AI is actually what we have and it's just math but when people talk about artificial intelligence they get the two confused and. In our heads, most of us have the Hollywood images close uh, close at hand. So when we say AI, or when I say AI to you, you might think about uh, one of the Hollywood images. You might think about Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator. You might think about the movie Her mm-hmm. or the movie Ex Machina. And so the Hollywood images are confused in there with the Uh, with the reality, because that's how our brains work, right? That's how memory works. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to be specific about our terms when we're talking about artificial intelligence. When you do highlight the differences, do you feel like you enter the, I don't know what to call it exactly, enter the debate between those who are sort of proponents? You know, I think you mentioned, and a lot of people probably think of Ray Kurzweil, 
and the singularity and his predictions about technology. And then there's a lot of sort of opponents that say uh, we'll never get there or that we will never reach AI. Do you feel like you're you're entering into that conversation or would you say that you're sort of trying to uh, sidestep it in a way and not get sucked into it? That that debate definitely exists. And there are very, very strong feelings on each side. Mm -hmm. My book is not about entering into that debate. Uh, My book is about understanding what tech can't do, right? Like my book is about saying, all right, let's not Let's not get carried away with our fantasies about Mm -hmm. computing. Let's stay firmly in reality and look at kind of what has happened in the uh, in the era of digital transformation. And let's think about what we can do with technology versus what we should do with technology. Well, and that's a great point that I think does separate your book from a lot of the other stuff that mentions artificial intelligence is that. I guess it's very easy to get into these future predictions. And so you've chosen to narrow in on a number of different adventures, like you've said. How do you make the decisions of what to include then as examples? Did you resist thinking about future predictions? For example, the the stuff that you've done uh, on election campaigns that you talk about, you could extrapolate and think maybe in the next election cycle, this is how it might be used and so on. You could you know, you could go into a future discussion, which I think is what a lot of AI books do. You don't really go so much into future. Did you have to consciously avoid that? Or did you just simply choose events from the past and stick to those? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think a little bit of both. I think that I I read a lot of uh, futurist tomes. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them were just wrong and misguided in their in their concepts about the future. I mean, as as a journalist, I don't generally speculate on the future. You know, journalists mm-hmm. tend to focus on what is and what has been. And so there are many possible futures. Um I think it it takes a lot of hubris to say, "Oh, this is absolutely how it's going to be in the future." And I actually want to bring more nuance to our discussions about technology because the the discussions about like, oh, everything is going to be perfect in the technological future have not actually gotten us to a really great place. Well, and you mentioned you mentioned a number of uh, of the things that technology has done, which is really in many ways, I won't go into all of them, but I, I just love how you you kind of list them out, right? It's uh, what do you say? It's created. An increase in economic inequality in the United States facilitates illegal drug abuse, undermines the economic sustainability of the free press, causes fake news, it rolls back voting rights, fair labor protection, it surveys citizens, and there are a number of things that technology has actually done. And when you compare it to those past promises, it seems to be virtually the opposite. How do you stay optimistic while also considering all of these very important social issues that you bring up? with the use of technology and what in what you do and what other people are doing. Oh man, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean cuz you I, I'd say this is a fairly optimistic book about tech. You're catching me on kind of a uh you're catching me on a bad day. <laughs> like I'm not uh I'm not particularly optimistic today. Um but I think in general like uh, don't we kind of have to be a little optimistic otherwise we'd all, you know, just throw up our hands and give up. Yeah, well, and you're you're definitely not doing that in the book, but you do, uh, I guess, call people out or call ideas out on the promises that we have been given maybe since the 50s and especially that have not come true and in, in some cases have gone in the complete opposite direction. Uh, the technological sublime clearly hasn't happened the way that, uh, that certain futurists or what have you would have predicted, mm-hmm. but you still seem to be a proponent of technology to a certain extent, right? Yeah. So how do you work that nuance? Well, I mean, I do. I love technology. Like that is literally the first line of the book. I love <laughs> technology, uh, and I love building things. I love the creative possibilities that technology affords us. I think that our ability to make new things and to use tools is one of the things that makes us human, and it is it is a source of great joy. It is a source of progress. But I think we do have to uh, have to look at 
uh, social forces, and we have to look at the consequences of the uh, of the tools and systems that we're creating, and we have to be responsible. A lot of the uh, ideas that we have about technology and society today stem from a very small, homogeneous group of people who were hippies in the 1960s. And they kind of went to live apart from mainstream society on communes, and the communes failed. And they were like, well, what are we going to do now? And they took those, those ideas, those failed ideas, and kind of transported them to cyberspace. And so I don't think that it's very wise of us to expect cyberspace to kind of to function effectively without any rules or government Because we have really good examples of the communes failing because of a lack of rules and government and also because of, you know, retrograde gender politics and because Mm -hmm. of economic inequality and like all kinds of bad stuff. So it just doesn't strike me as smart to to use these these hippie ideals in in today's world without critically examining them and and kind of removing what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's what interests me as well with a lot of the things that you're talking about is that there is still this idea that we can improve our lives through technology and we can come up with, in some cases, really brilliant solutions, but you warn against uh, what you call techno chauvinism. And so how do you know what are maybe some signs that you're moving from, let's say, an optimistic problem solving point of view to a techno chauvinist point of view? Hmm. I think one good example is in education. So for a long time, there was this idea in education that we could replace teachers. We could replace books with ebooks, and we could replace teachers with electronic learning platforms, and that we could decrease the number of humans in the loop in educational systems. It turns out that nobody likes that, hmm. that it doesn't work very well. Right. Like education is fundamentally a social enterprise. You're not just uh, giving kids knowledge, but you're teaching them how to be in the world. And so it doesn't really make a lot of sense to replace a teacher entirely with some sort of incredibly boring and formulaic computational learning exercise that honestly doesn't really work very well. I don't know if you've ever uh, if you've ever tried any of the uh, online learning modules. Mm-hmm. I've just never been incredibly impressed with them, especially the ones that are supposed to be fun, right? Like they do this thing <laughs> where they're like, oh, "Okay, it's for kids, and so we're going to make this math problem fun." Mm-hmm. And you know, it's just arithmetic. Like you need to practice your arithmetic. You need to memorize it. Like I, I kind of don't need it to be dressed up in something that is supposed to look like fun, but actually isn't. Like, I'm okay with just memorizing it. Yeah. And a lot of kids are. I remember I was, well, I was worried going into the profession of teaching and higher education with the massive open online courses and the things that were being made available for free. And a lot of people were saying this is the end of uh, professors and the end of teaching because why would you, why would you pay a tuition if you can get these kinds of things? online, but then the statistic rose up really quickly. I I can't remember what it was exactly. Maybe you know this, but something like 80 to 90% of the people who sign up for a MOOC don't complete it. Right. And so these things that seem really promising and are really great in some ways definitely have not replaced education in any meaningful way compared to the face-to-face interactions. Why do so many people, do you think, from, from having looked into this more, why do they get on this bandwagon that this online practice will change everything and then almost inevitably it doesn't. You know, I think that a lot of people made a lot of money making claims like that for a while. Hmm. And so people just kind of got into the habit of it because they thought, oh, well, the, you know, the techno chauvinists who have said, who have made these grand claims made a lot of money. So therefore I'm going to make these grand claims. And, you know, that's just one of the ways that people talk. Um, Specifically regarding MOOCs, uh, Sebastian Thrun, who's one of the, uh, one of the founders of the idea of MOOCs has actually backed off of them. Hmm. You know, he ran, uh, ran a MOOC at first as an experiment and then he realized that the experiment failed. He doesn't do them anymore. But <laughs> but somehow, like, that message, like, nobody paid attention 
to that message. Like there are still people out there who are evangelizing about the transformative capabilities of MOOCs. Now, the thing is, it's so much more nuanced than that because there are some MOOCs that are really successful. Like if you look at the ModPo MOOC, the uh, modern poetry MOOC that's run out of the University of Pennsylvania, it's phenomenally successful. And what it does is it makes a space for people to talk about modern poetry online. Is it making a ton of money? Probably not. Is it bringing people together to talk about something that they care deeply about that is making their their lives richer? Absolutely, yes. But it also doesn't run on its own. It runs because there's a very charismatic and talented person running it, and there's a lot of staff who works on it. So they do a lot of work to build the community and make the uh, make the MOOC a pleasant online space to be in. And so that's that's the work that you have to do to make an online community run, right? Like you can't just set it up and just expect it to run on its own. You need humans tending things and steering the ship. That's really expensive. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things about the book as well is how often sort of it, it becomes very apparent that you need a person in the loop, that the machine can do a lot of great things but we're not at anywhere close to an artificial intelligence that can be left to go and do everything. And so really, it, it's sorting data and computing data, which you know, obviously makes a lot of sense that that's what computers are best at. Yeah. I mean, they're literally computers, right? Yeah. So they can do that better than any person who is calculating things off of data tables and stuff like that. But figuring out what to do with it or figuring out the best ethical practices definitely is when you want a human to, to get involved. Uh, I want to ask you about uh, data journalism and what role you feel data journalism is playing in our society today and and where it ought to go or where you hope to see it go. Well, I'm glad you asked about that because data journalism is my favorite, favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> uh, so I adore data journalism. I think it's a really exciting field. I think there are a lot of amazing practitioners of data journalism. And I think that using code to do investigative reporting is just very, very exciting. I don't think that data journalism is going to replace traditional journalism, just like I don't think that automated writing is going to replace writing by people. I think data journalism is one of one of a number of subfields inside journalism, and I think it's a really exciting subfield. I think it's where I've chosen to uh, kind of plant my flag. But I think it's part of an ecosystem. I mean, you wouldn't want to read a newspaper that was only data journalism, right? Like you read mm -hmm. a newspaper because it's got this amazing array of stuff. You know, you read the uh, you read the wedding pages and you read the sports pages and you read about global politics and you read about local politics and you know, you read the food section and you read the travel section and you read the features and you read the opinion. Like it's the it's the mix of things and the surprise and the insight that makes a newspaper or makes a uh, a media organization's output special. I guess for anyone who might not be as familiar with the the term, what exactly are we talking about with data journalism? What what does that mean and what doesn't it mean? So when I when I say data journalism, uh, I generally say it's the practice of finding stories and numbers and using numbers to tell stories. Data journalism is generally, you know, the most popular uh, data journalism practitioners are ProPublica, The Upshot, which is a section of The New York Times. The LA Times does a lot of great data journalism. Uh, the Washington Post does a lot of good data journalism. And it is often characterized by data visualizations, right? So representing data in interesting ways online. I do a specific kind of data journalism, which is sometimes referred to as computational journalism. So I write computer code in order to commit acts of investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. And if I want to get really into the weeds, I mean... <laughs> Okay, you know what? We're just going to get really yeah, into the weeds. let's just hear it. So uh, <laughs> we're podcasts. We've got plenty of time, right? Yeah. Uh, so 
I do uh, something called algorithmic accountability reporting. So there are two sides of that. Increasingly, algorithms are being used to make decisions on our behalf as citizens. And so it's important to open up the black boxes of these algorithms in order to uh, see how decisions are being made. So one strain of algorithmic accountability reporting is folks who examine and investigate the black boxes. And so one example I talk about in the book is uh, Julia Angwin's amazing investigation at ProPublica of something called the Compass algorithm, which was an algorithm that was used to calculate a recidivism score. So when somebody was arrested, Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, algorithm would be used, uh, the the person would be interviewed, it would be 30 or so questions, and the answers to those questions would be calculated, and the algorithm, which is a series of steps for uh, completing a particular task, would uh, spit out a recidivism score, a score of how likely is this person to re-offend, to commit another crime if they are released on bail. So this recidivism score would be given to a judge after somebody was arrested, and the judge would use it in their sentencing decision. The problem is that the algorithm was constructed based on data that was put in. And the data is biased against Black people because there is structural racism in the world and because there's over-policing of Black communities. So the algorithm, mathematically, there was no way to make this algorithm fair for white people and black people. The algorithm was just always being more harsh to uh, black people who were arrested, and there was no way to fix it. So this was really groundbreaking reporting. Nobody had had thought of this before. Nobody had thought of investigating uh, what is actually going on inside an algorithm, and is it racist? Hmm. So that was a uh, that was a really exciting development in algorithmic accountability reporting. Now I do a different strain of algorithmic accountability reporting, which is that I write my own algorithms in order to investigate things. So one of the examples I use in the book is an example of a question I had about Philadelphia public schools. So I wondered if Philadelphia public schools had enough books. Because the same people who write the standardized tests that are mandated by the state also write the books Mm -hmm. that you use to prepare for the tests. Originally, I thought, oh, I'm going to write like some kind of like cool beat the beat the test kind of strategy that I'm, you know, going to teach to kids and, you know, kids are going to be able to do better on the test. It turns out that you don't actually need that. Like all you need to do if you want to pass the test is you need to read the book. Yeah. Like it's pretty straightforward. Talk about a non-technologically sophisticated solution. I thought that that chapter was really interesting also because it seemed like everyone in charge hadn't really thought to ask do kids have books. Yeah, nobody had thought to absolutely nobody had thought to ask it. Yeah. And the thing is like I'm not surprised that they didn't because there's no money. Hmm. Like there was at the year after I uh, after I did this investigation, the per student book budget in the Philadelphia public schools was zero, and I know that was a decision that was made like at some higher administrative level because no teacher in their right mind mm-hmm. would say, "Oh, I don't need books for children." That's just not something that a competent professional would ever say. Yeah, it was a mind blowing. Yeah. It was, it was really shocking. But one of the reasons nobody had ever asked this question before was that the calculation was really, really difficult to do. And so what I did was I built AI software in order to investigate this issue um, and also make it so that anybody else who wanted to investigate this issue also could either use the software and adapt it to their own school district or use my software and do additional reporting on Philadelphia schools. One of the things I've noticed, at least in 
in my experience is that certain communities, and I'm sure this is a community that you're a part of frequently, is the people who love technology. And some of them may be considered sort of techno chauvinists, but others may just simply be really into technology. And that's where they look for solutions. Having myself moved to a, a college in rural Georgia, I'm noticing they are the absolute opposite of techno chauvinists, that anything technological they are inherently skeptical about and uh, don't trust it very much. So there are, it seems to be, I guess, representative of two different major bodies in America right now and perhaps the world, right? Those who put virtually all of their faith or a lot of their faith in technology and those who don't. I'm just thinking about people who are very skeptical of technology, reading about how you've made it, let's say, an, an AI that searches for information about public schools, just inherently being skeptical once they hear the premise. That's a good question. I think it hasn't really come up for me, in part because I, I kind of, I, I understand being skeptical about technology. Like, I think that being totally averse to technology is not a good position. And I think being a techno chauvinist is not a good position. Like, I think that being somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. is, is the appropriate place to be. And so I think that in my work, I'm speaking to people who are at different ends of the continuum. I mean, I do have some relatives who don't use a computer ever like who just got cell phones last year in mm -hmm. 2017. And yeah, I do talk to them about my work and they have uh they have interesting things to say about it because everybody cares about public education, right? Everybody cares about campaign finance. Everybody cares about you know kids having books in schools. Everybody cares about justice. So I think that it's it can be a challenge to uh, to bring people together who are at uh, various points on the kind of spectrum of technological competency or enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a challenge worth meeting. Yeah. I mean, the work uh, that you're doing that others are doing in a similar vein is is pretty incredible when it comes to going through – I don't know how many um, filings from the um, from the elections committees and stuff like that to see where money is going. And uh, it was interesting, uh, one of your last chapters when you talk about how the computer program that you wrote can, I mean, among a bunch of other things it did with the elections, figured out that Donald Trump was spending, what was it, a couple million dollars on hats? Mm-hmm. And uh, which is an interesting thing and definitely something that when flagged and when made visual like that, as opposed to one of a billion pieces of information that you might have to go through if you were a human calculating all these things. It's a really interesting story. And I remember because I remember when that came out as a story and some people were posting that and some people were talking about that. But a lot of other people, I guess, who didn't want to hear that simply didn't have to hear it. Right. And this goes back to algorithms as well. Right. If they were mm -hmm. getting their media from certain places or getting their news from certain places, the algorithms that are are made for those situations are basically going to think so and so is getting is posting this. This person's not going to be interested. And so they don't even see it. One of the things I was thinking about in reading that, there's just so much noise, right, in the media. There's so much, mm -hmm. so many people saying so many different things. How, how can journalists using computers and using machine learning and these kinds of codes and algorithms, how can they get their message across, do you think? And how do they make sure that people sort of understand this is grounded in you know, not a perfect science necessarily in terms of the data available and stuff, but this is a fact-based approach to a large body of information as opposed to this is some guy shouting in front of a camera. I wish it were just easy enough to say, like, these are your two options, which do you like? And for everyone to choose the the more fact-based approach, but clearly that's not necessarily what's happening. So how do, how do data journalists get heard is, I guess, what I'm asking. So you know, my uh, my colleague Jay Rosen writes a lot about this. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, that really helps is transparency. Um, so data journalists will often uh, not only write a story but also post the code and the data that they used in order to make the story. The last chapter of the book is about, or the next to last chapter of the book is about 
a uh, system that I built called Bailiwick that takes campaign finance data and surfaces things that are potentially interesting to journalists. Mm -hmm. When I made that system, I wrote about in an academic journal about how the system worked. I posted the data that I used and made it downloadable, made it uh, palatable, and I was very specific about where the data was coming from and how I was drawing conclusions based on the data. So I think that the uh, that being very explicitly transparent about where your data is coming from, who made it, and what you're doing with it is a good way of uh, forming trust with a reader. Mm -hmm. If a reader is going to spend time with you, they need to trust you, right? And so the journalists I know do a lot in order to show themselves to be trustworthy people. And we take the public trust very seriously. Transparency, of course, is a fundamental principle of democracy as well as of, of journalism. At the same time, though, I think these algorithms, especially the black boxes, right, are inherently uh, opaque, especially if you don't have the technological sophistication to check the data yourself, for example, or even as another uh, organization to check the data. You may be having one expert talk to another expert, which I think on some level has to happen, right? Like ex people with expertise have to be putting these programs together. It would be lovely if everyone in the in the country could but it involves a certain kind of, of knowledge. But at the same time, you're making other things available to people that are much more um, you know, visually interesting and able to accessible once, you, once they've gone through the program. But I guess, how does transparency work in an age of sophisticated algorithms? Like how do you, how do you work with those two? To me, it seems almost fundamentally different ideas of being able to uh, have access to everything, which is great, but also not being able to necessarily understand anything without using a, a computer program that someone else has made. I think you make a really interesting point. Uh, I would say two things here. Um, I would say there's, uh, there's an issue of explainability and there's an issue of democratization. We were told for a very long time that tech would be democratizing. And that has not necessarily proven to be true. Like just because something is online does not necessarily make it more democratic. For one thing, because we still have a really profound digital divide. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have access to a computer, if you don't have access to uh, network connectivity or Wi-Fi, like you cannot access that information. And, you know, having computer access and having network access is an economic issue, right? Like if you don't have money, you are not online. Mm -hmm. uh, so tech is, so the first thing I would say is that tech is not automatically democratizing, right? Uh, the other thing I would say is that uh, explainability is such a huge issue in the, uh, in the algorithmic world, right? So there's a big, uh, big push toward doing explainable AI and I am I am all for it. Like I am totally here for explainable AI. Uh, but we also need to ask how ex how much is it possible to explain AI and explainable to whom or mm -hmm. comprehensible to whom? Because there are very very different audiences, right? Like you you think about this a lot as a journalist. You think about, okay, which audience am I talking to? What does my audience know? And so if I'm trying to explain AI to a group of fourth graders, mm -hmm. I'm going to use very different words than if I were trying to explain it to an audience of PhD students, right? And so there seems to be this this idea out there that, oh, if we can just like make explainable AI, it'll all be fine. Well, even if you do manage to make explainable AI, you still have the question of will anybody be able to understand it, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I explain my technology all the time. Like I explain my AI systems all the time and like I get a lot of blank looks. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, and that's and the thing. Like, if I, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, if I, you know, and I can go on at great length about how the thing works, but I would probably get a little boring after a while. Yeah, well, that, and if it was easy enough, if this AI, whatever you're explaining, is easy enough for someone who doesn't have a lot of background to understand it, it probably wouldn't be that sophisticated and, and that world-changing either. I mean, some tech is, is incredibly simple when it comes down to it, but if it, everything was that simple, then uh, they probably wouldn't be doing the incredible things that we think of when we think of uh, computer technology today. Also, I'm thinking about what I've uh, mostly been reading in terms of AI is that especially with machine learning algorithms uh, and newer and more complex ones, the designers don't know necessarily how it's working. Mm -hmm. And that could be a big problem, but it could also mean that we're exceeding our own current potential intellectually, which may be a good thing. I found it interesting that you, you mentioned in that program that you wrote about searching campaign finance that you, you definitely didn't want it to say that there was a 47% chance that this person is um, being fraudulent because of these certain statistics, not only would that be sort of poor reporting if you just did it at that level, but also uh, potentially uh, libelous. How do we then use computers at a sort of appropriate, in an appropriate way, where you're flagging things that could be interesting, in this case for journalists looking at finances uh, in elections, but also not in a way that um, sort of I guess presupposes also similar, I guess, to the to the sentencing programs that were very problematic because not only did they say uh, certain percentages, but then these percentages simply became, in many cases, the sentencing for people. So, wh where where would you like to draw a line, sort of, between uh, computer and human intervention? So, I would I would encourage people to think more about human in the loop systems than autonomous systems. So an autonomous system is one that runs entirely without human intervention. Mm -hmm. And a human-in-the-loop system is one that is designed so that the human is an integral part of the system. So the uh, reporting systems that I build, as you mentioned, they don't spit out a thing that says, oh, this person is definitely uh, guilty of campaign finance fraud. They say, this is the you know, the candidate's uh, spending record. And these are a couple of different ways of looking at it. And then it's the reporter's job to go in and look for something that might be interesting. And the reporter uses their expertise, right? So reporters are really good at uh, identifying what is usual and what is unusual. People who are experts in their field generally are. And so in the in the technological world, there has been a kind of deprioritization of expertise. Right? There's been this notion that, oh, since we have the internet, anybody can be an expert at anything. And, you know, that's <laughs> simply not true. Yes, absolutely. We have much better access to information now, and it is theoretically possible to, you know, to become an expert at a greater variety of things. But expertise in a specific field, human expertise, still has a lot of value. I want to embrace the idea of expertise as being something that we should develop and that we should value and that we should hold precious even in a world where lots of people can do things adequately. Oh, and another thing I should say is that when we're talking about artificial intelligence, it's important to distinguish between artificial intelligence and machine learning. So machine learning and AI are often used as synonyms now. That's problematic because machine learning is actually a subfield of artificial intelligence, the way that algebra is a subfield of mathematics. So there are lots of other uh, subfields of artificial intelligence. It's just that machine learning is the one that's really popular right mm -hmm. now. And machine learning does sound like there's a little brain in the computer, right? It sounds yeah. like it's artificial general intelligence. It sounds like, oh, the computer is thinking. And, you know, we like use the verb thinking when we talk about computers sometimes, which is even more confusing. <laughs> but machine learning is not about sentience. 
it's machine learning is narrow AI, right? Like machine learning is just math. What you do is you take a whole bunch of data, you build a black box, a model that is a representation of the data as it is, and then you can take new data and you can put it into the black box and it will spit out an answer for you. Like it's, it's very transactional. Mm-hmm. It's almost, it's almost disappointing when you look at it really closely. So one of the uh, one of the chapters of the book, I look at data from the Titanic disaster, and I demonstrate exactly what it looks like when somebody does machine learning. It's it's a little bit less glamorous than you'd imagine. Yeah, well, I, and I thought that was a great example actually. Now thinking about transparency, is the the fact that you you take the reader through and in an accessible way, I would say how you actually manipulate the data in order to get an answer or a prediction of who is likely based on their uh, the price of their ticket, their uh, sex, their age, and, and so forth, who's likely to survive the Titanic. Even though we already know this, we can see through what you show us in the chapter how you can calculate to a reasonable extent, not to 100%, but I think it was 97% accuracy in, in your example, of how you calculate those things and how you have to fill in gaps in some ways, which I think a lot of people don't really know or don't really associate because there's this idea that information is, especially with computers and artificial intelligence, it's perfect and therefore the information is going to be perfect. But in some cases, yeah, you don't know the age of the person and so you just put a mean in and you do these kinds of things all the time, it seems. Yeah. How do you show people these things accessibly like you do in in this, but not take away that, I don't want to say reliance, but I guess the belief that algorithms can help us. Because like I, like I said earlier, right, you're using algorithms, you're using machine learning, and you are, you're relying on it to help make better stories and to help bring politicians uh, to accountability, for example. But you also want people to know that this is a significantly flawed system to a greater or lesser extent. So how do you, how do you work with that? I think you use a lot of words. <laughs> a lot, <laughs> a lot of words. Uh, the, uh, the machine learning chapter, I mean, it is an example of explainable AI, right? It takes a lot of words to explain what's happening. And like, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, some readers skipped over some of the, uh, some of the harder parts of the machine learning chapter. And then I also include a lot of, of the actual data in that chapter. I include a lot of Mm -hmm. data tables in part to show that, when you're working with data, it becomes kind of numbing. It's very easy to forget that each row in the data represents a person with hopes and dreams and a family and feelings. I mean, it's dehumanizing. It's just it's just mm-hmm. numbers. It's very easy to think, oh, these, you know, I'm just doing math. I'm not doing anything that has real consequences. Or that, you know, this is not going to affect anybody's life in any kind of meaningful way, which is a problem. People who are designing machine learning systems really do need to understand how these systems are affecting people's lives. And they need to understand more about the ethics of what they're doing and also the consequences, the social consequences of what they're doing. It's definitely a problem that we don't generally have enough words in your standard journalism article to really get into what is happening technologically, in part because, like, it's sometimes not that exciting to (laughs) write about (laughs) how you analyze data. Yeah. And you do need to think about, you need to think about pacing, you need to think about being exciting when you're, uh, when you're writing for a mass audience. One of the ways that we get around this as data journalists is often we'll write a, a main story that like has the uh, results of an investigation. And then we'll also do a methodology post. So the methodology post is something that is usually online versus in print. It's also called the nerd box. <laughs> and that's where we talk about, okay, this is where we got the data from, and this is what we did to it, and this is the analysis, and you know all the mathematical or statistical or computational nitty-gritty. Well, and that seems to be a much more common thing now that the internet allows and I think is really is really great. Mm-hmm. It's probably a lot more work for journalists as well. So much more work, but worth it. 
You know, I think a lot of people don't necessarily appreciate that. Yeah, but totally worth it. it. It's really great to be able to communicate with audiences like that and to be transparent about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So then if you, I don't, I don't want to, and if you don't feel comfortable answering this or, or what have you, I know I'm asking you to uh, sort of speculate, which is something that you said you don't really do. That said, if you were going to, say, um, write a new book that takes off from these ideas but is more of a sort of how-to guide for getting people to, on one hand, as an audience, be more understanding of the nuances of AI, but on the other hand, for journalists who are doing this kind of uh, data research to meet their audiences in a more effective, democratic, um, transparent way... What would some of the what would that future look like, or what would that future, um, I guess, guide look like in terms of bringing these audiences and these journalists together in in more powerful ways? I mean, I think you really you touch on all, a lot of this in the book, but if you were going to be more specific about what journalists need to do and what audiences ought to do, what are some of those things you'd like to see happen in the future? You know, that's that's actually something that I cover in my class. I uh, I don't know if I could write a book about it, um, but I can definitely lecture on it, and I can definitely uh, design classroom activities and you know intellectually exciting projects uh, around those kinds of uh, those kinds of issues. Um, I think there's maybe not one single answer. Right, like we're we're kind of used to uh, the idea that there would be one pain point, and that there would be one solution, hmm. you know, one kind of computational solution that would uh, that would just fix that pain point, and that's an idea from Silicon Valley. A lot of people made a lot of money uh, using that particular rhetorical construct, um, but things are more complicated than that. So I think we need journalists to be more transparent about their methods and we need more news literacy on the part of readers and we need the uh, technology platforms to be more transparent about their algorithms and we need the tech platforms to be more responsible about the uh, social consequences of their actions and about the communities that they're building. So for example, Facebook absolutely could kick InfoWars off of its platform. Like mm -hmm. Facebook is a private company. They could, they could say, all right, like if you are uh, an inflammatory Holocaust denier, like you are not allowed to be on Facebook uh, or you're banned, and you know if you want to get back on, you have to write a 350 word essay about <laughs> why the Holocaust actually happened. Like they could do that, but they choose not to. Mm -hmm. And those are those are choices that they are making. Yeah. Um. And so that that's another factor. Like it's it's a lot of things that need to happen all at once. Yeah, well, and just to follow up on that, on the Infowars thing, for example, um, that would be amazing if, if you just forced him or if Facebook forced him to, to write an essay on that. Um, but <laughs> what, what kind of response, I guess, I'm also interested in what you think about the kind of response you maybe ought to give or Zuckerberg or who, whomever ought to give when the millions of viewers, I believe it's multiple millions of viewers uh, or listeners of Infowars, start to complain about Facebook and a lack of freedom of speech. And so so people who are listening to these kind of, for example, Holocaust denials, and uh, clearly, I, I mean, it's hard not to be judgmental, and I think it's probably appropriate to be judgmental in some cases about this kind of these kind of audiences who are not media literate or critical in any way. But I think ideally we would get these people on board too to say like, you know, this guy is just spouting things that make no sense really. And here is why you should, we don't want it on Facebook and why you shouldn't really be listening to it or whatever. But I can also see a lot of like millions of people getting very angry. Is there something to do as a journalist or maybe uh, some kind of media professional or a teacher for those audiences who are likely to get angry because they love Infowars so much? 
You know, I think that at a certain point, you just need to be an adult. <laughs> And you need to say, like, this is the community that I'm running, and these are acceptable things in this community, and these are not acceptable things. Um, I mean, we have laws. We have, we have regulations. I mean, Zuckerberg could kick InfoWars off at mm -hmm. any, like, that is absolutely his discretion. It is legally his right. It is part, it is there in the Facebook Terms of Service. I mean, he could. He just chooses not to. Mm -hmm. So there are always going to be people who are angry about decisions that you make. Like as a parent, for example, like sometimes I make decisions on my kid's behalf and he doesn't like it, but I'm his mom and I know best. And <laughs> or I, you know, <laughs> yeah. or at least I think I know best. And like that's what... Uh, that's what it is to be an adult. That's what it is to be a responsible human being. Like yeah. when you when you are charged with taking care of a community, sometimes you have to make hard decisions on the community's behalf. Well, and I guess what I would love to hear is that there's some way to get people to stop listening to InfoWars of their own accord, as opposed to stopping the, the accessibility point from something like Facebook. In terms of teaching journalism and best practices... Is there any way or is it just, is there any way do you think that um, either as a journalist or as an educator, there might be a way to get people to question their own use of InfoWars as opposed to stopping them from listening to it? Oh, gosh. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, if I had the way, I would. I mean, in my personal experience as, uh, you know, teaching media studies and stuff like that, definitely drawing people's attention to the fact that um, there is actual information and then there are things that people say loudly that has nothing to do with um, objective reality and pushing that. But again, these are people who have paid tuition and that um, that are in a class on media literacy. And I, get, I, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure nobody who listens to InfoWars takes classes on media literacy. So <laughs> I guess there's all sorts of trouble uh, in doing this because no matter what, there's uh, there there are these tension points, and there are, as you said, they're multiple. It's not a it's not a one trick thing. It is an interesting thing that with all of this data journalism, for example, with it, you have this power to expose a lot of things that are going on in the world. But people have to take journalism seriously, which, as we've seen, some groups continue to do, but other groups easily kind of just reject it completely. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the most troubling thing is to, to think about somebody doing, you know, really in-depth investigative reporting using computer assisted uh, res computer resources and uh, for it basically to be to be shrugged off by somebody who would rather talk about intersex frogs or whatever uh, or po <laughs> poisoning <talking> that? <laughs> that's the thing that i always think about is um is the the drinking water is making frogs gay is one of the one oh, of the best right, right, uh, right. Yes. stories yeah yeah to come from yeah but anyway um Maybe maybe they're just maybe journalists ju just won't hit every audience. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you know something really uh, something that's really interesting to do. If uh, if you or listeners are interested in doing uh, doing some of your own data journalism, is you can go and you can read the drinking water reports from your local municipality. So every. Every drinking water supply like regularly publishes reports and you can look at uh, pharmaceuticals in the water hmm. and you can look at uh, different elements in the water and it's really fascinating. You definitely have to keep in mind that low levels of pharmaceuticals are completely normal and are not actually are not necessarily affecting anything, <laughs> um, but everything that you put into your body goes out. Like, yes, the more pharmaceuticals that people consume, like the more pharmaceuticals there are in the, uh, you know, in nature. Yeah. 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 Like, did you see that story recently about um, opiates being found in mussels off the uh, off the coast of Washington? <laughs> it sounds vaguely familiar. I remember uh, hearing that uh, the use of, I think, birth, according to people, people who say that they've taken birth, or that they take birth control or antidepressants or cocaine, there's something like two or three times as many in the water, which proves that, you know, a bunch of people are lying about how much they take. <laughs> and this, I, I may be wrong, but this, I believe, was also uh, in the Washington area. Wow. 
All right, I'm going to look into this. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm very yeah. fascinated by uh, by water quality reports, um, but any kind of any kind of public data is potentially an opportunity for a story. You know, you can get really into water quality. You can get really into bridge inspections are another really fascinating uh, source mm. of data. So you can look at the um, bridges in your community and you can pull the bridge inspection reports. You can see when was the bridge last inspected? Is it being inspected regularly? Are there problems? Are there structural issues? Is there money in the budget to fix these structural issues? You know, lots of uh, lots of interesting opportunities to do data journalism in your uh, in your local community. Yeah, well, and I think you you demonstrate and you give links and uh, information in the book that anyone could really pick up the book and start on a on a simple level at first doing data journalism, which I think is a really cool thing that probably a lot of people don't think of as an option for them to do uh, when they're curious about a story. But maybe the more literate we get with uh, with technology and with how these things actually work uh, and their limitations, more and more people will take up this. And I think it's, uh, therefore, it's, it's a really interesting time. Hopefully, it's uh, it's going to get better and better in terms of what the quality of stories out there, the quality of participation and transparency. But yeah, Meredith, I just want to really thank you for talking to me today. I really loved reading this, and I definitely recommend it to people interested in, in these topics. Thanks so much. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. Once again, thank you for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. Check out our website at tinapp.org or visit us on any of the social media you're using. And please, if you get a chance, leave a review. I'm really honored to be able to speak with some really brilliant people in the weeks and months ahead, and I hope you'll tune in for that.